Have we all finally come to a relative consensus that inflation is a very real problem for us right now? Highest inflation rate in decades. Inflation rate reached more than six. Inflation may be cooking up the most expensive Thanksgiving. Inflation soared uh, to its highest level in over a decade. The biggest month over month increase since September. Get this, 2008. The highest inflation that most of us have seen in our lifetime. Inflation is out of control. Yeah, it's a problem, but it's worse than everyone is saying. You see, to give you, the viewer or reader, a relative comparison to where inflation is today compared to in the past, most of the talking heads will pull up a chart like this, comparing the Consumer Price Index, or CPI, over the years. And that's because if you Google US historical inflation, every place you look is pulling their data from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics CPI figure. And why shouldn't they use those figures? Why shouldn't they draw that comparison? In short, because the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, or BLS, has changed the way they calculate CPI over the years. That may sound conspiracy theorist at first. It's not. They absolutely have made changes, and we'll use documents from the BLS itself to explore exactly what those changes are and why they made them. The point of this video is not to suggest that they shouldn't have made those changes. We can explore that subject another day. I don't want to distract from the issue of exploring how the CPI today compares to the CPI of decades ago and the true implications that has for the inflation we are currently experiencing. So if you take away nothing else from this video today, it should be that looking at those charts that all those experts and influencers are showing you tells you very little about where we are today relative to the past when it comes to inflation. Well, if we look back historically, we could see that since the early 1900s, we've had a few periods of excessively high inflation and several times where it's exceeded 10% annually. You can't compare metrics when the way of calculating them has changed. Why do so many people do that? They'll sometimes use that comparison to say, oh sure, it's as high as it was previously, so maybe we should be a bit concerned, but we recovered from that, so hang in there. That's faulty logic. It's like if you had a financial advisor who came up with a clever system for helping you measure his performance and simplify the tracking of it over time. <laughs> because there are so many different aspects to financial planning that I can help clients, you, with, I want you to have a way of measuring how I've done with a single number. Let's call it my client performance index, or CPI, okay? Here are, are two of the metrics that contribute to my total CPI number for you. Investment performance, okay, and tax savings, okay? My target for your investment performance, what will be required for me to get a 10 out of 10 for this weighting of the CPI is 15%. And for tax savings, $10,000. So if I come in higher than those numbers, it's going to push my CPI higher than 10. If I come in under, it'll push it lower. And those are just two out of several factors contributing to the final total. We good? We good? Uh, okay. Now, in year one of your relationship, this advisor guides you to a 15% return and $10,000 of tax savings. Naturally, the CPI ends up at a 10 out of 10. Nice. Year two, eight out of 10. Year three, 11 out of 10, and so on. Now, let's say that 10 years into your relationship, he decides to change the way his client performance index is calculated. Maybe tax laws have changed and the investment landscape is more challenging. Whatever, he'll have some reason that could make sense. And so, he changes his calculation methods a bit. Now, as you'll recall, for the very understandable reasons heretofore provided, for a perfect score on the investment side, I only need 8%, and on the tax side, you know, 5,000. And this last year, year 11 of our relationship, I guided you to a 10% return in your portfolio and $7,000 of tax savings, pulling your total CPI for the year up to 12. Outstanding. That's higher than ever. How great am I, okay? Uh, sure. Whatever. <laughs> but he moved the goalposts. He altered the calculation methodology, so what does his 12 in year 11 really tell you about how he did compared to his 10 in year 1? How much? In fact, you realized more than 30% less in your portfolio and in tax savings despite the higher CPI. You see, the point is not whether or not you agreed with your advisor's decision here to change the way this figure was calculated. That change may have been entirely warranted, but it also renders comparison to past figures at best pointless, at worst manipulative. 
And this is undeniably true for the way we calculate inflation or CPI. The inputs are different. To learn about those changes, you can look at the report the BLS put out in 2008 entitled Addressing Misconceptions About the Consumer Price Index. They summarized those changes. In 1983, the BLS started using what is called the rental equivalence methodology for accounting for the cost of shelter. In 1999, they adopted substitution. And starting in 1998, they greatly expanded their use of what is called hedonics. Let's explore each to try to better understand their impact on the bottom line. In 1983, the BLS shifted the treatment of home ownership in the CPI to rental equivalents. Here's why any change with the way you calculate shelter is extremely impactful. It makes up 32.576% of the total CPI figure. It carries more weight than anything else. Now, in October 2021, that number went up by 3.5% year over year. But how did they get that figure? Was it by looking at the increase in the price of buying a shelter? Well, the National Association of Realtors said that the average price of a home increased by more than 13% over the last year. So it's not bad. Did they look at what people are paying on average to rent a shelter? Yeah, pretty much every resource you might tap for that puts that figure in the double digits as well. Yet the CPI is only accounting for a 3.5% increase? Maybe it's because more than 70% of that shelter figure comes from what is called owner's equivalent rent or OER. That's the big change they made in 1983. Owner's equivalent rent. Sound weird? It kind of is. Investopedia kindly breaks it down for us like this. Generally, homeowner's equivalent rent is attained through surveys, asking homeowners the following question. Has not the count just told us that all human wisdom was contained in these two words, wait and hope? And that's the end of the Count of Monte Cristo. Hold on, run along guys, I gotta take this. Hello? Hello sir, I'm calling from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. I just, I just have a couple of questions for you. Uh... Okay. Yeah, um, if someone were to rent your home today, how much do you think it would rent for monthly, unfurnished, and without utilities? I have no idea. I haven't looked into rental rates around here in like a decade. Hmm. Yeah, but I'm gonna need an answer from you here, sir. I, look, I really have no idea. So, about, about how much you're thinking. I, just the best guess. I, I, I gotta fill in the box here, sir. Uh, $2,500? I don't know. Okay, all right, all right, all right. Here's how the BLS explains what they're doing. And actually, the way they write this stuff can be pretty boring, so I asked my friend Chris if, if he'd read it for us. I'm, I'm calling him now. Uh, I just always think his voice makes this government gibberish more interesting. Hey, Steven! Hey, Chris. Uh, could you read that thing I, I sent you now? I, I really appreciate it. Of course! It. Anything for you. You really took a beating on my behalf. That old lady was... You would, you would have done the same for me. Uh, Alright, now. Go ahead. Okay! Measuring homeowner cost by rental equivalents is somewhat counterintuitive leading some to be concerned that the CPI is mismeasuring shelter price inflation. Owner's equivalent rent of primary residents, OER, is based on estimating the market rents for owner-occupied housing units. The cost of homeownership is treated as what economists call an opportunity cost. The amount owner-occupants would receive if they did not consume the services of their homes but instead rented the homes out. In essence, the BLS measures the value of shelter as the amount of money people give up by using it. For renters, that means the amount they pay for renting the home. For homeowners, it means the amount they lose by not renting out their house. I mean, I guess I get the concept. For renters, it's straightforward. It's what they pay. But for homeowners, it's not a real thing. You're kind of asking people to guess at something about which most of them probably have no good reason to give any serious thought. Meaning it should not be surprising if the number does not reflect reality. Very well said, my friend. Oh, uh, thanks, Chris. 
All right, see ya. Oh, okay. Well, bye, Stephen. Call me later. Now, to be fair, I don't envy anybody whose job it is to figure out how to best come up with a precise way of measuring inflation. But this way of doing it seems pretty disconnected from what's really going on. And, and although this admittedly is not the case all the time, it seems obvious that right now at least, this methodology in particular is significantly undercutting the reality facing Americans. All right, next question here for you. If someone were to rent your phone today, how much do you think it would rent for? My phone? Uh, y yeah, it's the new way we're measuring how much inflation is making things cost. We call this one phone owner's equivalent rent. I, I really, I don't know. Uh, here, hold on. Hey, Greg, come here. Okay, take this. Sit there. What? Uh, yeah, just wait, waiting on your number. Number? Yeah. Uh, a nine. Nine? Nine dollars? Okay, if you say, if you say so. And in that BLS Addressing Misconceptions report, they could have made it as long as they needed to in order to prove the point, to tell us why they use this methodology over others, why they believe this to be the best way to get a pulse on real inflation. But instead, they pretty much just point to a whole bunch of experts saying this owner's equivalent rent thing is the best way to do it. Yeah, of the 36 sentences they dedicated to this subject, they spent zero explaining why it's the best way. They spent six defining it, what Chris shared with us earlier, 10 telling us why one other methodology is not the one that they use, 11 sentences giving us examples of time periods when the OER increased CPI by less than some other way of measuring it. Okay, it's like they're very defensively trying to say it's not always lower than reality. And then nine sentences, a full 25%, just appealing to authority. That's the official name, at least, of the logical fallacy they're using to try to tell us that this is the way to do it. I hate this logical fallacy. In fact, I spend an entire chapter, one of the 16, talking about how bad it is within the financial industry, with mainstream investment advice. It doesn't prove their point. But here specifically, within this report, the most egregious example of this is when they appeal to anonymous authority, everybody's favorite kind of authority. They say, we asked 10 experts. And don't worry, all 10 were expert in measuring housing costs and all of the housing measurement experts agreed that the adoption of the rental equivalence method made the CPI more suitable. What more do you need? Experts said so. Four out of five dentists surveyed would recommend Trident for their patients who chew gum. But what about the fifth dentist? No! They didn't once explain why those experts say it's the best way to do this. It may be. They failed to properly explain that. And again, they could have made this paper as long as they needed to to help us understand. All right, almost done here. And thank you so much for all your help today. Um, if someone showed up at your house, a big, angry looking, a very muscular gentleman, demanding to know how much he could pay you in exchange for the use of your kitchen table. How much would you say? Four. If we used even the lowest rental rate increase that I could find, which was 11.4% year over year, instead of the 3.5% figure that BLS is using for the cost of shelter, the total CPI number would be more than 2.5% higher than it was reported. In other words, almost 9% year over year instead of the reported 6%, which in and of itself was alarming. So the use of rental equivalents is quite obviously, at least right now, suppressing the actual impact of inflation that we're currently experiencing. So what about the next one? Substitution. The CPI used to be calculated by taking a fixed basket of goods, same quantity, same quality, and comparing the price of that basket across time. If that basket of goods costs $100 at the end of year one, and then that exact same basket of goods costs $102 at the end of the following year, that would be a 2% increase in the cost of those goods. Okay, easy enough. But over time, the government decided that that wasn't really necessarily a reflection of the actual changes in the cost of living, just the cost of those exact goods. 
For example, if one item in that basket became way more expensive than other similar items, items that in theory would still satisfy the consumer in a very similar way, and if consumers, as a result of that one price increase, began purchasing more of other similar items instead, well then, the amount those consumers are spending at the store isn't necessarily going up, despite the price increase of that one item. So substitution is the idea that if consumers purchase less of a good due to price increases, it should have a lower relative weighting in the entire basket. Here's how this could play out. At the end of year one, filet mignon costs $20 per pound, and strip steak is $18.20 per pound. Now at the end of year two, let's say both have gone up by 10%. Filet is now $22 per pound, and the strip is now $20 per pound. So what was the inflation here? Well, if we were still doing a basket of goods, the inflation would obviously be 10%, because, well, everything went up by 10%. In other words, before the BLS was using substitution, that's what this would have been. 10%. Easy. Did you answer 10%? Because if you did, you're wrong. Because with substitution, it's a little different. With substitution, if in year two, consumers are now buying less filet due to the inflated price, the BLS will adjust the CPI to account for that shift. Tell me, did you uh, buy any meat uh, among your shopping? No, I didn't. Too expensive. If everyone who was buying fillets at $20 per pound is now buying strip steaks at $20 per pound, well, they would call that an inflation of 0%. Because people are spending the same amount as they were before to satisfy their steak needs, even if they may have preferred the fillet to the strip. The inflation was 0%. Making it happen. Hey, did you get the fillets? No, sorry, they're getting too expensive. I got strip steak instead. But we have always got filet mignon from every pack. It's okay. The Bureau of Labor Statistics assures me that you will enjoy the strip steak. I have a good time just to enjoy the filet. And if consumers now went half and half, filet and strip, the inflation from this would be 5%. You get the idea. Obviously, this is a made-up example, but it's a very real picture into how the system works. And whether or not you believe these adjustments are warranted, the bottom line impact here is always a lower CPI number than when using the BLS's previous methodologies. Next up, hedonics. Hey, bud. Have you seen my phone? No. no? Have you? Okay. Oh, what are you drawing? Yeah, I like that. I like the perspective. <laughs> Hedonics is the science of trying to figure out how much of a product's price increase is attributable to improved quality versus pure inflation. It, it's easy to see this with the rapid improvements in technology. For example, if the cost of a 32-inch 720p TV goes up by 10% from one year to the next, and it's the exact same TV, that's easily all attributable to inflation. But if that 32-inch TV that is now 10% more expensive is also now 1080p, how much of that price increase is due to the improved quality and not inflation? Maybe you agree that some allowance should be made here, as with improvements in mobile phone technology and computer technology and so on. But no matter how you do this, there is inherently a level of subjectivity. It'd be like, in my example from earlier of the financial advisor, if just before he calculated that client performance index over a, a, any given period, he could say, well, I'll tell you that the market this year was especially challenging due to, so my expectations for performance justifiably should have been lower. So instead of that 8% we talked about, I think 5% would have been a reasonable goal considering the circumstances. Well, I got you 6%, so I'd say I did pretty well. Don't you think? <laughs> Again, my point here is not to argue whether the way the BLS is doing this is right or wrong, whether they're just trying their best or whether they're actually being intentionally manipulative. None of that matters to our point here. When you introduce a significantly increased measure of subjectivity, as the BLS did starting in 1998, you cannot mathematically draw conclusions by comparing data from before those changes to today. A further problem with the hedonic adjustments is that you inevitably discount some inflation to allow for quality improvements that people may not even care about. 
if you just want a TV, you, you don't watch much TV, so any TV will do, you might be fine with a simple 24 inch CRT TV. 10 years ago, that was a popular model. Today, it's not even an option. If it were, it would likely be much cheaper than it was back then, but it's no longer available. Your hand is forced to purchase a more expensive, higher quality TV, whether you wanted that higher quality or not. And then, as they explain in their paper, the BLS must make some, they applied the emphasis on the some, I like to think of it like this, the BLS must make some estimate of how much of the price difference is due to the improved quality. Hey bud, have you seen my phone? No. Thanks. All these adjustments, rental equivalents, substitution, hedonics, have created a very different CPI number than was used pre-1983. Now, the hardcore skeptic might wonder if these moves were just the government trying to be sneaky. Now, when adjusting people's social security and other benefit payments, they don't have to make their cost of living adjustments quite as high as they otherwise would have. They have a little bit more flexibility, subjectivity, with their own report card. A lower CPI makes gross domestic product, or GDP figures, given the way it's calculated, appear stronger. The returns they pay out on TIPS, the government-issued Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, would be less. They would have a lot of reasons to do so. But even if you don't think that, even if you totally agree with all of the changes they made to the way they calculate CPI, because that's not important here, that's actually not even relevant, you cannot draw conclusions from those historical correlations. You can't say, oh, we were here 30 years ago. No, we were not. That was a different number calculated in a different way. Are we all on the same page at this point? Right, left, in the middle? That shouldn't matter here. From what we've gone over thus far, we should be able to agree that the number we're looking at now is much worse than it was 30 years ago. At the very least, that it's not the same and thus should not be used for a comparative measure. Fair? Hey, but I can't find my phone anywhere. Have you seen it? I don't think so. Yeah. Thanks, man. Now, it would be useful to be able to compare. And the only way to do that would be to either take the current rules and retroactively apply them, or what would be easier would be to take the method of CPI calculation that was being used up until the early 1980s and apply those same calculations through today. That's exactly what US economist John Williams has been doing for the last several decades. He's been calculating what the CPI would be since 1980 had the BLS not changed their methodologies along the way. As in, that basket of goods being measured hasn't changed in the same way that it didn't before 1999. And all the hedonic adjustments added after 1998 aren't being applied. And, and the cost of shelter is, is using the same formula it used to use before the change in 1983. In that historical context, the year-over-year -year inflation is about to pass what it was 40 years ago, at the height of the inflation crisis in 1980. Before that, we've only seen inflation this high two other times, after World War I and World War II. And even then, it wasn't really that much higher. Whether or not you agree with his calculations here, or you think he has his own bias, I hope you can at least understand better now that our inflation problem is definitely worse than the CPI and the government and the Fed let on. But probably the biggest difference between 1980, post-World War I and II, and now, is that back then, we admitted we had a problem. You have to admit you have a problem before anybody can help you. And so we were able to make plans to deal with it as a country. Now, we pretend like it's not as bad as it really is. The yeah, ceiling appears to be leaking. Oh, it's not. We call it transitory or, or temporary. We've looked into it and it's not. Opening the door for politicians to get away with things that are just going to add fuel to the fire. Uh, it's not. I'll show you the study. When discussing the differences in the way the CPI has been calculated, Investopedia warns, a prudent investor may wish to obtain more insight and a better understanding of these disparate views of CPI and inflation measures and the effects they may have on their investment decisions. That's one thing I hope to be able to help you with. That's why I created this video, to give you some specific things you can do to overcome this very real concern. And if that video is not there yet, because I'm still making it, then you should probably click here to subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Thank you, and good luck. Out. Yeah, just waiting on that last number. Yes, gun to your head right now. You had to rent toilet paper to me. How much? <laughs> uh, hello? Hey, hello? It's not 50, 50.
Fifty dollars. You said you'll take it. I'll take it.